Hi, so uh, I think this is a, an interesting project here. Is that a bucket of pitch? That is a big old bucket I of pitch. I never thought I would see such a wonderful large bucket of pitch. This is our small bucket of pitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this explain is what this size. is. So, uh, well, to, so we were talking about our tools, right? Um, uh, we don't make a lot of uh, you know new armor parts very often. We're not making a helmet or a breastplate to replace a missing one. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do every once in a while get to make a larger piece. And this is this is sort of a cool case study where we got to use our historic tools. Uh, so what we have here is a, uh, a Montefortino helmet, an Etruscan Montefortino helmet, uh, made in the fourth or early third century BC. And the helmet is the original helmet is just the bowl. Okay. Uh, but these helmets come with these wild cheek pieces, with these sort of embossed sort of domes and circles around them. Yeah. And uh, as a curator felt that you really couldn't appreciate the helmet without these cheek pieces. And you had They're probably so the rivet holes for the cheek pieces visible. And we had the rivet. I can get to that in a second. Okay. Yeah. okay. So uh, and a, there's a problem where you've got, see the nape, of, it, it kind of comes out over the nape of the neck mm -hmm. here. Uh, that is often misinterpreted as a brow. So you'll even go into museums and see these looking like jockey caps. That's what I would think. I would think that's the front, but it's not. Yeah. So to help people realize, oh, okay, this is how it's to be worn. We, it's tilted back slightly. We've got these cheek pieces. Uh, so we, we decided that this is a case in which we were going to make replacements. For the cheeks. For the cheeks. And so we decided to do that in a historically inspired way, uh, which we can do because of the resources we have here. So uh, we went to our two pitch pots. Two pitch pots. Uh -huh. uh, our larger one actually still has embossing work set into it from one of our predecessor armorers. And we decided that that is a living piece of history and we're not going to touch it. This one had nothing in it, so we decided we're going to use this. This is a 100-year-old pitch pot. It's and been in use in the Arms and Armor Department ever since its founding. Can you walk the audience through how this gets used? Yeah, so you've got a, you've got a bowl, and a, this is a hand-forged steel bowl, uh, into which is poured some concrete just to sort of fill out the bottom, and onto that is pitch. And now, what is pitch? So pitch is a, it's a pine resin, and it is a great substance because when you heat it up, you can actually sink a material into it. Mm -hmm. And it'll hold on to it real tight, uh, and it will resist blows. If you take a sheet of, you know, bronze, brass, copper, iron, anything like that, and you just hit it in the center with a hammer, it doesn't really want to form a dome shape. It kind of wants to fold on you. Right, right. So by sinking it into the pitch, it gives it the grip and the resistance for you to make these sort of big depressions. You're sort of holding onto the whole thing the whole and thing. localizing the pressure. Yeah, and okay. resisting the urge to fold and encouraging it to stretch directly under the blow. And this, and because this is a resin, it looks solid, but it moves a little bit. Yeah, that, yeah. You can actually yeah. see a loose hammer blow set in there. So, uh, and you can control how much, how resistant it is based on the temperature. The, the warmer it is, the easier it'll, it'll, it'll uh, take a blow and the, the cooler it is, the more it will resist. So uh, what we did here is we, you know, cut out a, a, sheet, of, uh, a sheet of bronze mm -hmm. and sort of hammered out these concentric rings, sort of folded that over using our oh. vast collection of chasing tools. Um, so we've different yeah. shapes are for different parts of these lines and curves in order to embed them yeah. into the... Yeah, you, uh, you sort of start with the interior and knock out your sort of large forms, your big mm -hmm. domes. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to want to anneal this uh, occasionally too so that you can keep stretching it without, without uh, cracking it. And annealing it is just like holding a blowtorch over Yeah, you it. just heat it up okay. uh, and then you can come right back to working. Uh, then you flip it over, and on the exterior, you sharpen up your lines, and you can uh, planish, uh, you know, smooth out your, your, your crests and your valleys again, uh, and get a smoother uh, surface, and then you grind and you polish and get down to the surface you want. Uh, this is sort of in the early stage here, where I haven't gotten to the planishing and the grinding really yet. So this is, this is, this is like a test piece, and this isn't I, I mean, I guess people could end up being confused and think this is some sort of mold for this, but this is just the remnants of a set yeah. of hammering. This is the artifact of the hammering. Gotcha. This is what's left over afterward. And then what we end up with, fold it over a hinge, and with the added of a little uh, tab for your chin strap, is a Montefortino style cheek piece. And then that's been uh, patinated and some little bit of in painting in order to blend it in with the surface. And you had uh, some example you were following to know your. We did. That's actually an interesting story because I didn't have any in hand when I started working on this. So I was going from images of ones that we were fairly confident were original and of the correct type. And we got one in on loan right before this was going on view. 
and mine was a little off. And so I remade it oh, wow. <laughs> for a very short period Both of time. Both cheek pieces? Uh, just the one cheek piece. Okay. This is one of the earlier ones that is displayed against the wall. So this will actually, <laughs> one day I will finish it and this will become the other cheek piece and it can oh. be reviewed in the round properly. Oh, so this is slightly less correct than this one exactly, because this yeah. will be against the wall. But yeah, sure, you've got yeah. you to make your priorities. This is a large restoration, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we don't really want to fool anybody. Uh, you know, we, we, in conservation, we have an ethics where we don't want to uh, alter original material if sure. we can avoid it. We don't want to fool anyone. You want you to know what's there. So this is noted on the label that these cheek pieces are restored. The cheek pieces are both uh, dated, so you know when they were made. On them. On them. And most importantly, it's not attached to the helmet at oh, all. Oh, what so a clever ruse. If at any point in the future you wanted to display this as 100% original material, you can. There's nothing's damaged. Nothing's altered. I'm imagining you sitting here with this pitch and hammering in and maybe something happens that doesn't quite go right, but it goes wrong in a way that tells you, oh, that's why that mark is in that piece of armor yeah. over there. I, I love getting actually one in hand and looking up close. You're, you you suddenly feel better about yourself as a craftsman <laughs> when you can see that an actual professional is having the same problems you are. Well, I remember yeah. Terry English, when we were making armor in Cornwall, was telling me that he doesn't measure the rivet spacing. He's mm -hmm. like, because there's no piece in the royal collection that they're at all consistent. He's like, I use calipers, but just that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were doing everything by hand and by eye and... You know, you, you get some things that are wonky where, you know, uh, the, the comb and the visor slits are slightly off from each other. And it's, it was just the way things were. And they accepted it. They didn't have I, a problem with that. Is it, have you come across two pieces of armor from the same shop that came from two different collections and get to see the marks of the same hand? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, there are known makers and yeah. you get to see their pieces a lot. And there's sort of consistencies, um, which is it's just lovely to see. You get a sense of the actual. Yeah. Themselves. I mean, that connects you right there to that whole history there. Yeah. There you're talking to them across that. Mm -hmm. oh. Wow. <laughs> I mean, just even the idea that you guys are using all these old tools to replicate and fix and make these things, but that you're also using the old materials and they are still viable and still mm -hmm. producing is really thrilling. Yeah. I mean, they, they knew what they were doing and, you know, there's no reason not to follow in their footsteps. You know, and you get to learn a little along the way. I mean, actually doing things in a historic method, you learn about the object. When I have replicated stuff by old makers, I, and I realize I'm walking in those same footsteps, it is one of my favorite feelings at the bench mm -hmm. because it's like a, 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 a conversation through time. It's yeah. To, to do something different and it work and go, oh, that's how they did it. It's just such a great feeling. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. This is amazing. <laughs> well, thank you for visiting.